we now have a sospiog for a short slideshow. Most of these pictures appear in my book Buffoonery and Easy Sentiment. Very few images of the actors in Kennedy Miller's company have survived, and most of those that have are of poor quality. Generally, only the very famous and well-to-do, like Irving and Coquelin, had production pictures taken of themselves, and there was no theatrical repository in this country to house such material. Fortunately, we now have the Dublin City Library and Archive gradually building up an impressive collection of theatrical memorabilia. All the following pictures, except the photograph of Kennedy Miller, which is from the Irish playgoer, are from the archive here in Pierce Street or Brunswick Street, if you like. The first is not a photograph, but a caricature of Frank Breen, drawn by his colleague Ian Ireland. He's seen here as Feeney in Boussico's melodrama Aaron a Pogue, a revival of which is now, as it happens, running at the Abbey Theatre. The strange noise you may have heard was Yeats and Lady Gregory turning in their graves. <laughs> at this class of buffoonery taking place in their theatre. <laughs> Frank Breen was from County Down. He played in many stock companies all over the British Isles before joining Kennedy Miller, where he was in revivals of Tyrone Power's comedy, Born to Good Luck, and he created the parts of Flynn in The Nationalist, Rafferty the Spy in Wolf Tone, Brando Byrne in The Insurgent Chief, and Niblock in The Ulster Hero. The Evening Herald said that Breen was the most interesting villain on the Irish stage. Another reporter drew attention to the fact that Breen seemed to enjoy the hisses and catcalls as tributes to his talent. Comments of this kind emphasize how much these melodramas were considered to be entertainments. The villain's present was relished. This is something recent scholars, particularly those from the New World, fail to understand. Here is Kennedy Miller's leading comic actor, James O'Brien. Were it not for J.M. Singh's visit to the Queen's in 1904, O'Brien's name would be unknown to students of theatre history. Singh wrote in a magazine article that some recent performances of the Chakran, as they were played the other day by Mr. Kennedy Miller's company, had a breadth of native humour that is now rare on the stage. Mr. James O'Brien especially put a genuine richness into his voice, and in listening to him, one felt how much the modern stage has lost in substituting impersonal wit for personal humour. Singh used the term comedian in the French manner, meaning actors, les comédiens. One senses that Singh would have liked O'Brien to be cast in the Well of the Saints across the river, but of course that was an impossibility. James O'Brien created Danny O'Hay in A True Sum of Erin, Hogan the Rappery in Sarsfield, Patsy Dugan in The Old Land, Thady McGrath in Lord Edward, and many others. This is Iron Ireland. He was known among his colleagues as Harry, uh, so Iron must have been a stage name. For Kennedy Miller, he created the parts of Squire O'Hanlon in The Old Land, Captain McMurrah in The Sham Squire, Captain Ellis in The Ulster Hero, General Talmash in Sarsfield, and he also appeared in strong supporting roles in revivals of other plays, generally as officers or members of the landed gentry. After Kennedy Miller's death in 1906, he and James O'Brien formed their own company called the O'Brien Ireland Combination. Among the very young members of their company were Anu McMaster and Cyril Cusack. H. Somerville Arnold was an English actor recruited by Kennedy Miller to play smart young gentlemen and romantic heroes. Here he is as Phil Hennessy in The Nationalist, the landlord who sympathises with the movement for agrarian reform. He played the lead in the Victoria Cross. 
He was Hardress Cregan in the Colleen Bourne, Beamish McCool in Aram Napogue, and Captain Molyneux, as you might expect, in the Chocran. He died shortly after this picture was taken. The obituarist in The Playgoer stated that his greatest triumph was as Lord Edward Fitzgerald, and that he had been in constant ill health, which he had managed to overcome several times, always returning to the stage. Thus ended the life of one of the most promising actors we have ever met. It's terribly sad. Next we have Annie Hilton. She tended to be cast in the straight roles. She created Eileen O'Moore in A True Son of Erin, Kate Carney in The Irishman, Mary Doyle in The Insurgent Chief, and Lady Rose de Burgh in Sarsfield. Frank Fay, when theatre critic for The United Irishman, said that he preferred her Anne Shute in The Colleen Bourne to her Fanny Power in Aaron Pogue, but he didn't bother to tell us why, which was rather remiss of him, I think. Here is Monica Kelly. She usually excelled as spirited peasants and outspoken ladies' maids. She created Kitty Malone in Lord Edward, Peggy Ryan in Wolf Tone, and Eily Blake in Sarsfield, and several other vivacious servant parts so similar one wonders how she managed not to confuse the lines. <laughs> According to an anonymous columnist in The Playgoer, her style is very natural, and she can be pathetic or humorous as occasion demands. Her love-making is always racially droll and mirth-provoking. <laughs> Whatever racially droll love-making may be. Monica Kelly was Moya in the Chakran, of which Singh wrote so appreciatively. As you might expect, she also played Eileen O'Connor in The Colin Bourne and the title role in Aram Napogue. Mrs. Glenville was the third in the trio of Irish actors, tantalizingly briefly noticed by Singh, in the Chochran, in which she played the mammy, Mrs. O'Kelly. She seems to have been with Kennedy Miller for his entire period as director of Irish plays on tour, that is, 17 years. She created The Widow Maloney in The Old Land, which Joseph Holloway described as a real gem of a performance. She is a genuine Irish humorist, and her sayings and doings seem to be nature itself. She had already played the very similar part of Malshi in Kennedy Miller's revival of Edmund Faulkner's extravaganza Peep of Day, which had been a continuing hit in London since it first came out in 1863 at Covent Garden. I've included this photograph, even though it's unnamed, because it's such a striking image. My guess is that it's either Maud Tremaine as Lady Rose in Sarsfield, or Clara Russell as Kate Maynard in the Victoria Cross. I don't know which lady I'm insulting. <laughs> the carved chair in the photographic studio keeps reappearing. This is the only picture I was able to find of the man himself, Kennedy Miller. It's from the Irish Playgoer magazine. You'll agree that his is an unprepossessing face, someone you might pass in the street without remarking. The same might be said of many directors. <laughs> you would hardly imagine that this was the man who selected and directed the large and capable company of Irish players, and not only that, but also organized the complex touring schedule, making sure that this year's visits to 30 cities did not repeat plays seen there last year or even the year before, and seeing that the actors were well rehearsed before their opening in unfamiliar houses. Here is the Queen's Theatre poster for a revival of Theobald Wolfe Tone 
in 1901 with Frank Breen, billed as the villainous Rafferty, a spy, and Tyrone Power as Tone's garrulous manservant, Mac Mahon, is significant that billing is given to the comic characters and not to the actor who played Wolf Tone. <laughs> Incidentally, the Tyrone Power here was the nephew of the actor-playwright of the same name who was so popular on the London and New York stage. Confusingly, a third Tyrone Power was a Hollywood actor in the mid-20th century. The director, Tyrone Guthrie, was a great-grandson of the first Tyrone Power. This is an advertisement for a performance of Lord Edward by Kennedy, Kennedy Miller's powerful Irish combination at the Metropole Theatre Glasgow in 1898, depicting the vivid scenes, episodes and vicissitudes in the life of Lord Edward Fitzgerald, an entirely adequate description. The orchestra, as well as supplying incidental music in the play, entertained the audience in intervals with selections from Donizetti, Suppe and E. Strauss. E. Strauss, who is E. Strauss, I wonder? Do you think it's a, a misprint for J? This was a week-long run, but in some cities of smaller population, the program was changed nightly so that you might see Lord Edward on the Monday, Saturday and Saturday matinee, the Green Bushes on Tuesday and Thursday, the Colleen Bourne on Wednesday and Friday. You can imagine the amount of effort needed to alternate the stage settings and to travel them. Leading players were allowed an annual benefit performance in a favourite role, from which the profits went entirely to that performer. Kennedy Miller was not an actor, so he did not appear on, in his benefit, which was made up of a play supplied by members of his own company. And as his name became more and more celebrated in the profession, actors, singers and musicians from companies in town that week gave their services in a kind of enormous variety show. In this one, on February the 3rd, 1903, his own players gave the main item, Tyrone Power the First's Sheridanesque Born to Good Luck. It was a very long evening as the Telegraph reported next day, with 16 supporting items. The ones I would like to have seen were Curtis, Leo and Noblesse, mystifying illusionists, and the Gibson Henry celebrated comedy cyclists. <laughs> Not to speak of the Mrs. Kinsella and Gorm, Irish jig dancers. No doubt pre precursors of Miss Lily Comerford. The Edison Pictures is an announcement for next week. Of the contributions of so many participating artists, the Evening Telegraph continued, it shows the high appreciation in which Mr. Kennedy Miller is held in the profession. Mr. Miller has been willing at all times to give the benefit of his time, labor, and experience gratuitously to those anxious to serve laudable, charitable, and popular objects in this city. <laughs>